my general interest is in talking about systems such as this uh, cormorant uh, scheme that you see, uh, consisting of uh, particles, each of which is powered or energized. It could be a swimming microorganism or a macro one like this, and groups of them moving together regarded as a kind of uh, material. So um, my interest really is in taking collections of such objects. It could be a bunch of gnats forming a cloud like the things that you see sometimes above your head uh, in the evening when you're walking outside. It could be an organized state of uh, millipedes uh, like these seen in Hyderabad in the monsoon. Uh, it could be the cells in a developing tissue. And you could take these materials and view them as a material, not as just a living thing, but as something the material science scientist studies. And you can ask questions like, you know, what's the pressure of an insect cloud? Is it like a bunch of gas molecules moving around in a box? You can ask, is this object just a weird kind of liquid crystal? I mean, it consists of elongated things. They're spontaneously lined up. Is it a funny state of matter, which I can study with concepts similar to those that come up in liquid crystal physics? Or uh, you can ask, what is the role of forces and mechanical flow in organizing tissue into the macroorganism that you see? And I want to emphasize, these are not just sort of funny problems, oh, how cute you can look at flies or gnats and think of them as a gas. These are grand challenge problems, because if we can get a physical understanding of cells, tissues, developing tissues, wound healing, uh, the, uh, the transition to collective migration in cancer, uh, I think a great deal could be done to solve these vital problems, not by just thinking of biochemistry and genetics, but by thinking of mechanics and flow and force. And there's a huge trend in present-day physics, and little by little in present-day biology, to think of systems in this way. So um, it's also given rise to an interesting enterprise in physics, which is, look, you all have studied collection of gas molecules in a box, system at fixed energy or system at almost fixed energy, at fixed temperature, in other words. And you study those, uh, and you understand thermodynamics. Now, supposing instead each of the particles there was continuously powered, each of them had an onboard fuel tank, or each of them had enough sugar in the surroundings that it converted into motion, you would have a collection of particles which we would then call active matter. If you can understand it, you can understand some of these systems. If you can understand it, a real test of understanding is can you make a copy of it? Can you imitate it? Can you make artificial active matter? So these are the kinds of things I'm uh, very, very interested in these days. Now, you want a theory of this stuff. The first question is, can you make a theory of how something goes from randomly moving to moving in an organized way? There are very popular, very successful theories of this, starting actually from uh, movies of stampedes and becoming part of physics over the past 15 years or so, which says you have a particle <coughs> among many particles, and each of these guys tries to line up with its neighbors as best it can, and having lined up, moves. So imagine doing this all in parallel. You can do this in a computer simulation very easily. And what you will find is that if the error that each of these agents makes in aligning is small, and if the number of neighbors is large, then this state where everybody is on average moving in the same direction is favored. What that direction is is fixed by some initial accident. If the noise is high or the density is low, you get a random state. So this is not that different in some ways from how something becomes a magnet at low temperatures and uh, uh, you know, is random at high temperatures or something is crystalline at low temperatures and liquid at high temperatures. So those kinds of ideas have been used fairly successfully to understand this phenomenon. However, this is a satisfactory theory of the spatial organization, of the pattern, of the picture, but says nothing about the mechanics. If you want to understand tissue as material, you need to understand the mechanics. So we got interested in this problem some years ago and uh, said, look, got a bunch of particles. Assume they have a uniform assured energy supply. Um, and each particle is capable of propelling itself. Now, how does it propel itself? Either by pushing on the medium around itself or by pushing on other particles around itself. Mutual pushing is the propulsion mechanism. These are systems, not systems in which you are exerting a total force in moving them. So the profile of force around each particle has two bits pointing in opposite directions, what we call a dipole. These objects, such as this bacterium here, or this alga here, 
disturb the medium around themselves in characteristic ways. The bacterium by pushing fluid out along its long axis, the alga by doing a kind of breaststroke, pulling fluid in along its long axis. If you think about these problems collectively, rather than just at the single particle level that has had already been done in fluid mechanics, you formulate what amounts to a generalization of something that many engineering students learn. You can make up the continuum mechanics of active matter. You've got collections of particles, you're energized. Think of them not as individual particles, but as a continuous medium, and build a mechanical theory of these. So this is what happened initially in our research, and then <coughs> a group in uh, Paris and Dresden did the same thing, thinking not of collections of organisms moving through a fluid, but of what goes on inside one cell. Inside each cell, there are these filaments. There's a sort of polymer scaffold called the cytoskeleton. There are molecular motors running on those filaments. This combined system, again, is orientable objects plus internal propulsion. So the same equations emerged in the description of the cytoskeleton. And this is why this work began to look not just a curiosity, but rather interesting, because if you can start to say something about the mechanics of cells, the mechanics of cell aggregates, then you have a chance at answering some of the questions that I posed a couple of slides ago. Okay, now, this wasn't just a description. This was a predictive theory. The theory predicted a couple of very um, direct uh, consequences. One, it turns out if you've got a collection of these particles, and you measure the viscosity of that collection, and you compare it to the same collection when those particles are dead but still present, then the guys that swim like this make the suspension more viscous than when they're dead, and the guys that swim by pushing make the suspension less viscous than when they're dead. So this is a simple prediction which you can understand by just looking at this cartoon. When you make a set up a flow like this, you align these filaments, they pull back on the flow. You set up a flow like this, align the filaments, they push back on the same flow. So this will lower viscosity, this will increase viscosity. This simple idea has been tested now in various, with various improved theoretical um, formulations also over the past several years, and as recently as last year, uh, has really been confirmed stunningly in a set of very nice uh, experiments. Uh, the other uh, prediction is, supposing you have an aligned state of a bunch of people. Imagine the density is high enough that these things are kind of packed and they're all lined up. Is that state sustainable? If it is a bunch of dead molecules doing Brownian motion, that state would be organized and would stay stable and it's called a liquid crystal. What happens when each of these guys has these built-in stresses on it? It turns out, if you've got these kinds of guys, a state that's all lined up on average like that, if you disturb it slightly like this, sets up flows which further make the disturbance go in the same direction. So you've got a bunch of pullers all swimming together like this. They're spontaneously unstable to this disturbance. They're unstable to this disturbance. They distort, and spontaneous flow gets set up. So this material, aligned self-driven particles, is actually a material which has self-starting flows in it. OK, I can see I'm getting out of time. Um, and this um, interesting idea was confirmed rather beautifully in several experiments, but in particular, in experiments looking at what goes on inside one cell. This is the nucleus of a cell. And you've got this blob here, which is go the nucleus, which is going round and round at a few degrees a minute. So you've got this cell plated on some polymer pad. It's sitting there. Its boundary is fixed. And the cell, the nucleus is actually spinning. Why is it happening? It ha it's happening basically because of the effect that we just talked about. And if you look at the surroundings of this nucleus, you find that the, these cytoskeletal filaments are all nicely aligned, kind of aligned, but with a slight distortion. And there's a circulating flow going on there. The flow has a profile which we can calculate, and which we can compare to the measured value, and at least qualitatively it looks very similar. The rotation rates also look very similar. And so this is a beautiful confirmation, something one thought about initially at the level of organisms, instead being discovered inside one cell. There have been many other tests of this idea, and the general idea is borne out very nicely. Active, aligned matter is unstable. It starts flowing by itself. Um, now, moving away from organisms and cells, one of the things I talked about earlier was, how do you make, can you imitate self-propulsion? Can you imitate, of course you can imitate self-propulsion. You can, there are cars and there are clockwork motors and things. But how simply can you imitate self-propulsion? And on what, how tiny a scale? Well, one cool way to do it is to take an object like this. This is a group at Penn State. You take an object like this with, say, half platinum, put it in a medium containing a chemical that this catalyst bit likes to break down, say, hydrogen peroxide, then what will happen? You will have an imbalance of the distribution of hydrogen peroxide on the two sides. There will be less on the catalytic side than on the other side. 
This will give rise to a They'll get flow close to the surface, and this guy will become a swimmer. So our interest was in saying, okay, you can uh, you can do this, but can you make even smarter particles? Can you make particles that not only propel themselves, but if there is a gradient in some chemical, can you make particles that turn around to point in the direction of the gradient and then swim towards it, or that run away from something? So it turns out you can. I won't describe the mathematical details, uh, but. Um, what you can do basically is you can design the pattern of catalyst on the particle and the pattern of how the solute particles interact with the surface and make particles which will have desired chemotactic properties. They can, they can orient, they can signal to each other by this chemical diffusing around and you can get all kinds of interesting patterns. So this is interesting ongoing work. Um, another even sillier way to imitate motility, now moving from the chemical to the very crudely physical, is to take a surface and sprinkle, put a bunch of rods on it, and all objects like this little stick in my hand. You place it on there, and imagine shaking the surface up and down very fast. Then these objects will get tossed up and come down, like this, and if the two ends of the particle of these rods are different, the contact mechanics is different when this end hits or that end hits, like this, and so these particles start hopping, preferably, preferentially in one direction. That direction itself changes because of system being a little noisy, so if you look at one single particle, it will do something like this. I don't know how to make it big. So that's one little particle, top view. It's, the surface is vibrating up and down. You aren't biasing the motion. The particle's own orientation is telling it which way to go, which is rather cool. This is an idea uh, that a group in uh, Took your hand, but we took the idea and said, if you have a collection of such particles, will they form an organized flock? So initially we studied this for particles whose two ends were the same and tested some fairly wild predictions of our theories of active matter and turned out right. Uh, thereafter, uh, we decided to study mixtures of these kinds of particles and um, round particles. So a uh, group at ISC. Uh, study the collection of little rods like this surrounded by a bunch of beads. In those experiments, the rods were uh, brass and the beads were aluminium. These are all big objects, 5 mm long, 1 mm thick. And uh, what they found was initially nothing terribly interesting. You've got a bunch of rods, a bunch of beads. The rods are running around like they want to go somewhere. The beads are sort of coming in the way and it looks like boring. Okay? Take the same system and study it keeping the number, not increasing the number of these pointy motile particles, increasing the concentration only of beads. And before your uh, very eyes, you will see that the rods organize themselves into a coherent pattern. They all start moving in the same direction. The rods themselves aren't bumping into each other, they aren't jostling each other, but they manage to align each other. Okay, and then some more time. And uh, so amazingly, so what we were able to show also is that this whole effect is not an artifact of having walls. You can repeat this thing in a faithful, mechanically faithful computer simulation. You can see this flocking phenomenon happen even in a computer simulation where the system has no boundaries. So if you go off one edge, you come in the other. You can understand it theoretically by, by looking closely at what's happening in the simulation. Here is one rod moving that way. Here is the flow of beads around it. Notice that out to quite a distance, the beads are moving in the same way as this rod. The distance out to which that motion persists in the same direction gets longer and longer as you increase the concentration of uh, the beads. The other part of the story, sorry, I just killed the fly. The other part of the story is that if you have one rod pointing that way, let's say, sitting in a medium of beads flowing that way, I claim the rod will turn to point in the right direction. This also one tests. You can see in the computer study, if nothing else, if you impose a flow up the screen, this guy will start turning the point the same way. So this two-part dance leads to positive feedback between the rod making the beads flow and the beads aligning the rods. And you can make this fancier, but I've taken out the equation because I was told to. Excuse me, um, and uh, come up with a quantitative and predictive theory of 
at what density will this ordinary transition spontaneously take place? So we're able to do that rather nicely. So we've been continuing this very, very interesting area, driven primarily by pure curiosity, how these ridiculously simple little systems, or the more complicated cellular systems, or herd flocks can uh, display such spectacular properties, partly in the hope of just understanding matter in these strongly driven states, but also in the hope that a deeper understanding of the fundamentals will ultimately lead to important applications. You'll be able to understand cell division better, you'll be able to understand tissue better, you'll be able to understand how in these uh, funny systems, a small number of motile particles is able to drag a large number of non-motile particles because the spheres by themselves, the beads, then so just jump up and down in place and go into the rods. There's, some really, there's really cool physics and there's the potential for real application in areas ranging from engineering uh, to biology. So lately we've been looking at slightly different systems. If you look at these clocking models, we've been adding some more realism, like that the, uh, it takes time for uh, one of these guys to respond to its neighbors and reorient, and the interaction of one of these guys with the one in front of it might not be the same as the one of this guy with the one behind it. These effects lead to additional striking features such as traveling waves and uh, funny instabilities. And this is work that at present is going on. So um, I'll close with that just in time. I hope I've convinced you that we have in this active matter viewpoint a paradigm for understanding the mechanical and statistical properties of living materials over a huge range of scales um, uh, with implications for very serious and very practical issues. It's important to get the general principles right and make robust, not model-specific predictions first, because if you can get those right, then other things will follow. And some of those are clearly starting to turn out right. And we've been having a lot of fun studying artificial flocks. With that, I close. Thank you.